The first one is for what came in during Jenny's presentation. And they were asking if you, if you could explain the difference between scenario planning and risk assessment. Um, well, I guess, I guess the difference is that risk assessment is just that. It, it assesses risk and really not much else. But the scenario planning process looks at the risks, but it also gauges the positive impacts from the intersection of two drivers um, and, and really looks at the range of impacts. They could be negative, they could be positive, they could be risks or benefits. Um, and then the other difference is that it also includes a step beyond that. Um, it really incorporates, like Crystal described, creating a management plan based on the impacts that are, that are observed. Um, so I think risk assessment is probably wrapped into the scenario planning process, um, but I definitely think it's something much, much less than the scenario plan scenario planning process um, includes. Crystal may have something to add to that. Nope, I think you covered it. All right. Um, and then the next couple questions were based on sustainable ag practices. And in your experiences with the scenario planning, how do sustainable, quote, sustainable practices uh, change the scenarios? Do they improve things? Do they not improve things? Well, basically what we did um, for ours was, so during the actual scenarios, um, we kind of, we didn't get into big assumptions about how people were going to behave in the future. And um, we kind of did, like David mentioned, of focusing on, we kind of gave people what have been the historic trends, and then just a real brief snippet of kind of what are the projections for our region. Um, and that's kind of with a base assumption of not a lot of change. And so there are definite um, social factors. So that was kind of the people piece of the drivers of that how um, we collectively as a world respond could definitely change what those scenarios look like. Um, but we tried to not get bogged down in that piece of it because that's a little bit beyond um, what's happening on farm. Yes, I know that there are things farms can do to reduce their climate, um, their source, being a source versus a sink of carbon emissions, but that wasn't really our focus. Um, and then when we got to, so that's kind of the first piece, for, does it change the scenarios? And then I think the second piece of that is, is how does that get then worked into the management options? Did we look at sustainable agriculture management options? And those folks were definitely at the table. We had um, several, we had a couple organic producers, we had cover crop folks, um, we had folks who were, um, I don't know, like I said, we tried to include the whole range. And basically what we tell them at the beginning of the management piece is that this is not, um, to cast judgment on any particular one. It's a true brainstorming process so that we can kind of get the options on the table um, and then, a pro, you know, and then they can look specifically for their operation, you know, like take David's um, approach and say, so for my operation, which of these, which of these makes sense? You know, for what I want to do, my region, um, my values and beliefs on, on how I think things are going to proceed. Um, because, like I said, it's a little bit beyond our scope to really get into some of the social um, and regulatory and economic pieces of it. Okay. So it limits, it, I mean, it's, it's hard because when you actually, when the farmers are actually trying to make those decisions, they have to include all of those things when they're talking about what is my actual option I'm going to do. And so we probably, in extension, need to challenge ourselves for how can we help um, in that decision-making process because that's the reality um, for the farmers on the ground is that they can't kind of just say, okay, this is my boundary. I'm only going to look at it because that's not the real world. All right. All right. Um, just going through the questions, I think you've covered a lot of them in just that discussion there. There is, um, so there was several questions about um, carbon dioxide and the increases in those and how is that, um, how is that taken into account or how to, 
how do you prevent that kind of thing? If you're using those mitigation practices, how do you, how does that impact this? Right. Well, and I mean, I won't go into it to too much um, beyond to say that that's kind of wrapped into we didn't get too far into this is what the projection will be like that's the nice part of scenario planning is that it can look at those multiple futures and so it makes you more nimble but you have to make sure you're doing that last step that Jenny mentioned which is monitoring what's going on so that you can kind of stay on top of where's this thing headed um, because there's just so many drivers um, that you can't just make a decision and leave it on the table. I think that that gets to I, one of the other pieces was having more strategic planning. And I think that that's what David was getting at is instead of just being reactive, how can we be strategic? And then scenario planning also encourages us to monitor what's going on and continue to come back. So I'll let Jenny and David chime in, but that's kind of my, my take on it. Yeah, I think that sounds good. All right. So I think I think you've pretty well covered this, and um, the last question is more of a comment in my mind, and I think you it would you would confirm that is so. This really goes back to the development of a land conservation plan and really planning for land land stability or st sustainability in the long term, and this is helping to do that. Correct. Yeah, I, I would just say that um, I think if we can move towards thinking um, about where we want to go versus just reacting um, to what's given uh, would improve any farm operation, no matter kind of what your market or what's your production style or system of just being thoughtful about where you're headed. And I think, you know, progressive um, producers who are still successful have been doing that. I mean, it's not, it's nothing new. We're hopefully just giving people some more tools uh, to help them be successful. Good, good. Um, the last question that has just come in here, um, do you have any thoughts on added pest pressures that with climate change are there? Are, I, I think I saw some of those, in some, of, in some cases there's gonna be some added press, in some cases maybe less, correct? Right. Sure. Yeah, it depends totally on the um, what the insect's preference is. And so I think we'll see things shifting around. I mean, drought years tend to favor different insects than wet years. And generally, warmer climates let mo insects move north. Um, it's a little bit outside of my area of expertise, so I'm kind of just relying on what I've heard um, from some of those experts in how insects have moved, but I think we've already seen um, some diseases and pests um, moving their ranges around, so we'll probably continue to see that. I think that's where your scenario planning comes in, too. You bring in experts that know some of this stuff and yep. say, you know what, we're seeing a lot more of this. It's right on the edge of Nebraska coming north, and so you better be ready for it. And so I yep. think that's part of that scenario planning, getting that group together. Exactly. Okay. Um, Carl also asks how bio, biotechnology helps agriculture deal with climate change. Um, do you see that changing? Have you, I don't, when you've done this, do those things, have those things been taken, taken into account during some of the scenarios that you've done? And how is that going to, is it going to slow climate change? You want us to start talking about genetically modified crops here? I don't think so. I know. <laughs> I'm not you saying, Maybe you do. I don't know. <laughs> well, I, I think like biotechnology in general, though. I mean, it could be, yeah, it could be genetically modified crops. It could be um, how, well, just how we deal with things. Well, I would go back to what I said earlier about, at least for our, um, when we're talking about options, we're brainstorming um, kind of everything and putting it on the table and then um, having a discussion about the pros and cons and, and, and when they're appropriate and when they're not, because I don't think there's any silver bullets to this. We're trying to, we're trying to say we're going to see variability in the future. We've seen it in the past. 
and how do we become better <clears throat> at planning for it? And I think that takes a whole suite of options. And so that's kind of what we're shooting towards is not saying, well, this will fix everything, um, but let's look at everything and its pros and cons, and those are different in different climate futures. So something that works, you know, like I said, hopefully there's a few robust things that could help us in all situations, but in reality there's things that help in a drought, there's things that help in a wet year, and trying to figure out a balance of, of how do we tackle that um, is not an easy discussion, but that's why having kind of, like I said, farmers have always done this, but what we're trying to provide is because things seem to be changing faster, that if we can be a little bit more strategic and thought out in how we do it, this is a method that people can go through um, to make sure that they're not missing something important. I think that that um, uh, when you're talking about longer term planning and we're talking about the soils and stuff like that and healthy soils, I think that's a longer term thing to build better soils to to stand up better to drought or wet weather. I think that's something that covers all all future climate scenarios mm -hmm. almost anywhere. We've probably made mistakes in the past with how we treated our soils. And so all of this would be good. I mean that's kind of a no-brainer to make our soils better, I think. So is that sustainability? Is that whatever you want to call that? I think that's a good thing to have. I don't know how that, I don't know how that fits in the conversation now, but seem to make sense. Okay. Dennis asks, um, isn't this all about surviving climate change? It isn't about solving climate change, but I think it is really about solving climate change to a certain extent because as you look at these um, scenarios, then you can change a little bit to help. I, in in what I did with the adaptation planning, it was not about reducing greenhouse gas emissions at all, solving climate change. It was basically responding to what changes are happening and we're not looking at the future. That's kind of another thing when we talk about mitigation. We have a whole other series in our, in, our, um, in our project that we worked on was looking at mitigation and reducing that. And, and with that, if you want to discuss that, it's, it's all about being more efficient with what we have. So um, if we are producing more with less, then that's reducing that carbon footprint, reducing the emissions. So, I don't think in either scenario planning, may have them wrong, but scenario planning or adaptation planning guide, we were talking about reducing carbon emissions. No. Oh. It, it might come along with a few of the options. So, for example, you're talking soil health. So, if part of your soil health is building soil carbon. I mean, that's a mit mitigation as well. But we specifically um, kind of sidestep that discussion because this – this also is a really nice way to kind of start the discussion. Um, we have not done in Nebraska any, uh, well, very little climate programming. And so this is kind of just getting started and it's it's um, a lot more acceptable. I mean, people are much more interested, I guess I'd say, in, in how do we deal with what's coming down the pike and we kind of avoid some of the um, political discussion of, of what do we do about it. So it's sidestepping it a little, um, and maybe we'll get there, but we're starting here. 